So, so now we're going to do ceramics, and I'm excited because we're going to hear Julia say all the brilliant things, and I'm going to just use this to make a big mess, and it's going to be great. You let me into the Zoom. Oh, yeah, right. we can let you into the Zoom. Oh. Oh, you're not in the Zoom again. Oh, we'll let you left. Yeah, I did. I left so that I would do that thing. All right. So we're going to start off with clay basics, and this is sort of a blend of chemistry, geology, and all the pottery things, mostly pottery. But it comes up with a good question of, of what is clay and what the heck is that structure on the right? Um, so the basic property of like the clay is a ceramic. And uh, as you can see on the slide, it is a classification of like roughly 30 different minerals. It's dirt. It's dirt. The um, the major important property of it is that when it is wet, it has a plastic consistency, meaning it can be molded and formed. And then when it's dried, it hardens. Um, and clay itself is found in deposits, it's mines. There's a picture of a porcelain mine actually right there. And um, there are just a ton of different things that can be done with it. It's one of the oldest, uh, most important bits of technology that uh, the human race discovered at some point that allowed us to do a lot of other things. Yeah, I love when you found this, we happen to be sitting together, the structure on the sides is the scaffolding for these guys to climb up it. Yep. And yeah. that's wild. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it supports uh, layers added later. Like it's just, there's there's nothing it can't do, so, so to speak. Um, yeah. It's, it's used like there's a cuneiform tablet. It was used for writing. Yeah. Yep. All Very sorts cool of stuff. stuff. Um, and it's all just dirt. Yes, <laughs> it is dirt. Um, we are going to be talking specifically about ceramic clay. There are things like air dry clay and polymer clay. We're not covering those because they don't fall under these categories. Um, so just as a sidebar there. Um, typically for most ceramic applications, and that's going to be, you know, making something that's more or less functional that you don't want to fall apart. Wedging is a great uh, first step because, in fact, it's kind of mandatory for a lot of things like throwing pottery on the wheel. Um, what it does, the way you can see the manual wedging up at the top of the screen here, uh, where someone is pushing the clay kind of in a circular motion. And what it's doing is aligning all of the clay particles in the same direction. It's getting um, air bubbles out and it's sort of evening out the consistency if there's um, you know, different consistencies within the same level of clay. Uh, the best metaphor I can use for this is that um, the clay particles themselves, which you can kind of see in the, the upper corner of the slide here, they're like little plates. And if you imagine like a brick wall, if you had say, you know, a, a brick wall built as it normally is, you know, all the bricks stacked on each other, you know how strong that is. If you took all those same bricks and dumped them in a pile on the ground, they're less useful. It doesn't work quite as well. And so that's what wedging or hugging, <laughs> which is a different term where you feed the clay through a machine that basically does the same thing mechanically. Um, like that prepares the clay to be its best self. Yeah, this is, self. I like this microscopic picture because yeah. these are the same clay particles. They're like little sheets all in random order. This your pile of bricks. <laughs> and here they are when wedged, they layer together. And you can imagine sort of, not only would you have those pancake stacks that are there, but sometimes they would overlap and interlock in ways that make them genuinely much more stronger. Yeah. Um, and all of that on the microscopic level for adjustment is done by the simple process of just like pushing it against the table a bunch yeah. of times. Um, so this is particularly important when throwing because um, you will get stronger, thinner pots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably the most important spot. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you're going to hear some terminology. One of them is clay bodies. Um, Clay is a substance, a clay body is a specific mix of clays and then other minerals and ingredients that are intended to perform a specific function or have a specific purpose. Like they're, they're mixed to have certain properties. 
Um, the most, the three most common ones that you're going to come across are going to be earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain. Um, earthenware is sort of like the ubiquitous, it's sort of like the, the, the cheap mass produced, you know, the like, you know, world's best dad mug is made, you know, which you're going to be getting yeah. a lot of soon, yeah. Yep. Yep. is going to, you know, be made out of that. And um, it is, it, you know, it's, it's, fine but it's not particularly durable um you know you whack it against the counter it's probably going to break off you know these things aren't, aren't the strongest um and it isn't uh completely vitrified which we'll get into this so it's sort of a porous texture which means that if you want it to be waterproof i.e make it a mug you gotta put a glaze on it so that it has that glassy surface to keep water from absorbing um, we are going to talk about cones in a minute, um, but there is a cone range of cone 05 to cone 1 for low fire. It's like a, a firing scale yes. that you put in with the thing and you can see how fired it is yeah. when you look into the oven. That will make sense in a moment. Yeah. Um, stoneware is a lot more durable and that's the sort of thing that you're going to see uh, production potters and professional ceramicists using uh, most of the time. Um, it is by itself waterproof and it's really tough um the uh the mid-range and high fire are going to be the two kind of categorizations of stoneware typically and you can see the cone ranges for those again it will make much more sense soon um porcelain is sort of like the top end and it is a very it's a beautiful but very tricky clay body um it's mostly kaolin which comes, the name is derived from the Chinese town where it was originally. Oh, yeah. Cool. yeah. Um, and it fires at the very high end of the stoneware range. Um, its most interesting property is unlike all the other clay bodies, it becomes translucent when it's fired. So that's how you get those. It's, it's super hard, very durable. Um, that's why a lot of really like that that like paper thin bone china and stuff like that that's all going to be porcelain because it's the only um clay body that can actually perform in that way and it is fired way high like cones 10 to 13 and um throwing with it is trying is like throwing in with jello it's very Sounds, interesting that sounds gross in every it's, way it's very peculiar yeah it's, it's a challenge um it's it's definitely something that you don't start out with. my <laughs> we were we were just finishing these slides so this is the first time i'm reading this just reading that makes me think in chemistry terms of like it's a whole different category of material it has its own separate name that's a big sign and then it's not uncommon in like plastics and organic materials that when they become incredibly consistent and there's very few like Inclusions or other stuff, and it's a high level of purity, you get a translucency or transparency that, that comes into existence. That makes sense. The porcelain would be the highest end of this, the hardest to work with, and like probably a very pure, just those little plates and no extra yeah. dirt in it. And I mean, this is kind of an interesting, like another example, like when I we were talking about plaster before, how like it's called plaster of Paris because there was a lot of it around Paris and that has that majorly influenced the art and architecture of that area yes. just because it was available the availability of porcelain in China here is totally absolutely influenced um the you know the arts at, of the entire area there because they had this on hand and they used it yeah like within their culture and so it's like it's a very um like ceramics are a super integral part of a lot of cultures around the world. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, all right, moisture. Okay, okay. so um, the, yes, the fundamental truth of ceramics is managing your moisture. Um, not too much, not too little. This is a, right. a classic freshman mistake right here. Uh -huh. you, you put it in the kiln and it's not dry enough and it's a bomb. Yeah. A little tiny bomb. Everybody else, that'll be fine. Yeah. Everything inside will be the opposite of fine. Yep. The, uh, that is a, that is a real elementary school art kiln right there. Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, look at this adorable, <laughs> uh, yeah, little critters. They just didn't make it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so clay in order as like, we went back to the first slide clay in order to have that plastic quality where it can be molded and worked, 
Um, it has a moisture range. Uh, the plastic limit is where it's just wet enough to be mold, like it's it, to be molded, where you can still push it around and mold it, but it's very, very firm. And then the liquid limit is where it's just dry enough to hold its shape, but it's still going to be functionally quite sloppy at that point. It's not going to puddle, but it's really, really wet. And in between those limits is when where you can actually work it. Yeah. Um, if we go back to that analogy of the brick wall, um, differences in moisture between areas of a clay piece cause cracking. The reason for that, if you imagine a big brick wall, it's just even, everything looks great. And then halfway through it, imagine just magically removing all of the mortar from one side of it. What's going to happen? All of the bricks are just gonna fall down on themselves. The wall will be shorter because all of the mortar is missing. And at the place where that change occurred, there's gonna be a big crack because it's two, like essentially two different walls now up against each other rather than a continuous one. And that's what basically happens. All of those little clay particles, when the water is removed, it shrinks because the, the clay, the water is no longer there. And um, if that happens unevenly, you get cracks. Typically that's gonna be because of thickness or it dried too quickly. Sure, that makes sense. If your so, walls are real thin and your base is real thick. Yep. Problems. Yeah, no. and um, so evenness, like with ceramics, no matter what you're making, if you have something thin next to something thick, more than likely you're going to have cracks. And the, these look like examples because you have the foot that's thicker. And then the base is probably fairly thin. Yep. And there's your, your difference. Yeah. And there's cool. other possibilities. Of, yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, oh, and I think. Oh, these the, are good examples yeah. to go right along with it. I love this graniotomy. Uh, <laughs> okay. But it's so that you can see, you, you said this is like checking to see the thickness is even and crossed. Um, part of it, but also you're creating um, a release valve for air pockets uh, if yeah. it's going to explode because um explosions happen most often because of moisture but also can because of be because of trapped air because a ceramic is inherently inflexible especially once it starts to fire um and air and water both expand rapidly when they're superheated so you're creating these little like super pressurized chambers that will explode and that's the reason that typically happens um to to avoid the cracking, if this piece, this portrait here, were made solid, we're doing this in order to hollow it out so that all the walls are roughly the same thickness to avoid cracking and to avoid any trap moisture or air. All those little pinholes are basically, if there's going to be some sort of internal explosion, it's giving it a way out that's controlled rather than it just randomly blowing off the side of her face or something like that. Yeah, which rather, just happened. I blew, I blew up my brother's face once. That sounds <laughs> terrible and yeah. charming. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so like this way, it would blow into the head instead of out of the eyeball, nose, yeah, whatever. Exactly. Cool. So you can see down here, there is a- I've okay. definitely seen pots like this. Yeah, of pots. And the, the important part of this is that there's plastic over it. What plastic does is it creates an area, like kind of a terrarium. It's a it's a com an evenly moist environment, which means the entire, like everything within that bag or under the plastic is going to dry more slowly, but it also means that it's gonna be a more consistent moisture throughout. Because the thing with, with clay is that whatever's on the surface, like the, the, the clay that is closest to the air is drying quicker than the clay that's farther into the piece. And you don't want that because that can cause flaking and other issues. You want it to all dry kind of consistently at the same level. So that's the reason that's done. And another thing, if you see this grate underneath all of those um, pots there, allowing moisture to circulate underneath is also, or I'm sorry, air to circulate underneath is also important because if you put something flat against, say, a wooden shelf, there's going to be a lot more water that collects there versus the thin walls that aren't in contact with the shelf. Yeah. So oh, that makes sense. Well, all right, I'm, my like teacher brain is saying we need to go faster on each yes. slide. Okay, so. that's that's fine. The fire and clay, this is an exciting time. That's yes. the inside of a kiln. The glowy extra bright bits, those are the heating elements, if you want to know. But the pots are in fact glowing. Right, because they're <laughs> so. glowing hot, yeah. Yep.
Okay, so cones, that terminology, the term actually comes from these things that are cones, they're pyrometric cones. And um, functionally, like all play bodies are going to say, like, this is a cone 05 or a cone 10 or a cone 6. That tells you the temperature that it needs to be brought to in order to fire properly, okay, to turn it into a ceramic, which means vitrification, which means that it's basically turning to glass, at least to some extent, okay? Um, low fire, less heat than high fire, more heat, and there is a range. This thing you can see right here, it actually goes from not glowing to glowing, and that's like the literal color that the pots are at this temperature. Yep, this so. is black body radiation, which is a fun science experiment <laughs> to talk about, but we we yeah, don't need that's to. today. Yeah. Lots of physics. Yeah, and you'll see, I don't know if you guys can see it, but the cone, the approximate cone, that little brown bar on the side, there's a range that goes from 022, which is very, very low. That's like not even, like that's that's barely anything. I think it's, it's like just over a thousand degrees, all the way up to 2,500 degrees. Um, Celsius. Um, 1,400 oh. Celsius. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Fahrenheit. Um, which is cone 14, which would be the very highest fire porcelain. So I, the one thing I'm going to point out is there is a huge difference between a cone 06 and a cone 6. Mm. So yeah. um, these are like, they look to me like decimals. Yeah. Sort of, yeah, or like yeah. negative numbers, maybe. Yep. It's a weird mm. system. Yeah, it is a little strange, but that zero matters a lot. <laughs> yeah. You see it, okay. Um, the the pyrometric cones, you can actually physically see it. Like in the red, there's actual, oh, yeah. in the is... kiln, you, you would peek through and see if they've melted yet, and that'll tell you how hot the kiln is. And that's what they look like when they come out. Each one is a different clay body that's intended to melt at a very specific temperature. What it measures is the heat warp, which is time plus temperature happening in the kiln. There's an art and a science to ceramics. It's just this whole little primordial thing going on in there. That heat work sends my physics brain <laughs> yeah. into overdrive, yeah. Um, and But the functional thing, it is incredibly important that you know your clay body and its properties before firing and that you fire it to the correct cone. Because if you fire it too little, it's not gonna turn into a ceramic. It'll just be a really crumbly, thing made out of dirt that's very, very dry. It won't actually, you know, do the thing it needs to to become ceramic. And then more often, if you fire it too high, it just turns into a puddle, which yeah. will then spread over the shelf, down the shelf, into the kiln, surrounding everything else around it, yada, yeah. yada. And that's like the Man point. Disaster. That's the point of these cones, right? Yeah. So that when it Puddleifies. Yes. You can see the temperature that it hit. Yeah. And it's like, oh, no, 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 we stop, 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 stop. Yeah. yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Cool. And it gives you other information too. Sure. Um, so back to that whole water thing clay must be bone dry, meaning dry, 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 not, not even slightly moist to go into the kiln or it will explode. Um, there is usually two steps to firing. Um, there's going to be a bisque firing where it goes halfway there. So it's it's ceramic, but it's not completely vitrified. So it hasn't totally turned to glass, which means it's still slightly um, absorbent, uh, porous. Uh, and then there's the glaze firing. So most pots go through two cycles. Um, the bisque is for the clay itself. It will be It'll be fired, but they're still really delicate and brittle. Uh, the glaze firing will not only harden the glaze, but it frequently also will vitrify the clay body. So you kind of go halfway and then you go back for the glaze firing, go all the way up the scale. Um, and you don't have to stop and do the glaze firing. You can go all the way to vitrification. Hey, Julia, is a lot of this handled by the computer on the yes. side of the kiln? Oh, Magically. that relieves lots yes. of stress that I was yeah. having. Yeah, uh, this whole thing right here is a BIS firing schedule. It shows you how long it stays at each temperature and how quickly you're able to ascend to the next level and all this other stuff. The computer does it. Great. It's, it used to be manual. That's, I'm so glad that yeah. technology has advanced. It has. Yeah. So much easier. Um, so for firing processes, oxidation and reduction is like a chemistry thing. It totally is. Yeah. As a, as a broad sense, it sure is. Um, for ceramics purposes, oxidation basically means there's plenty of oxygen. Uh, electric kilns are 
you know, by default oxidation kilns. Um, and reduction is where there is more fuel than there is oxygen to burn it. And they both kind of create different effects. The reduction is done usually with some sort of fuel burning kiln like gas or wood. Um, they create carbon monoxide. You do not hang out around them when that's happening. Um, and the interesting thing that right here, this is a copper glaze. It's the same glaze. The first, the left one was fired in oxidation and the right one was fired in reduction. Basically what happens is in reduction, since there's not enough oxygen in the atmosphere, um, the molecules or electrons I, get stolen, the oxygen okay. gets stolen from the glaze and a, causes a difference. Okay. On a scale of one to 10, how nerdy do we want the explanation? Five. Five, okay, all right. Uh, the Statue of Liberty is green, but it's made of copper. It has rusted. Copper rusts differently than iron. Iron is super weird and how it rusts. It's just around us all the time. Um, but the blue green is copper oxides. So oxygen atoms have attached. In order for that to happen, there needs to be oxygen in the environment. The one on the right just kind of looks like copper because oxygen didn't get to attach and then it turned to a glass and now oxygen can't get in and turn it blue. That's it. Okay. All right. So um, I mean, I get it. Sure. But what, like, what? in terms of what application would make the difference of like, oh, I'm gonna fire this and oxidate it versus let's reduct it. Other than color, because what did you do? Well, you the glaze in that color? <laughs> this um, potters, potters want, or like ceramics, people who do ceramics, can only, you can only get certain effects with certain environments and certain techniques. And there are a lot of um, glaze effects that you can only get through reduction. And there's also the sort of uh, like the gift of the kiln ruling that you get these magical surprises that you couldn't possibly anticipate out of any kind of fuel burning firing. Where, you know, you get a lot of duds too, you know, but that's the sort of thing. There's this sort of like chaos element to it um, and artistry that you, you can get very consistent reliable things with oxidation, but you're not going to really get surprises. So do you use a different kiln to oxidate with yes. this reduction? Yeah. Um, I mean, using the kiln and a reduction kiln? Um, yes. Uh, you can make an oxidate, like an electric kiln, do reduction, but it's very, very hard on a kiln. It wears out the elements and things like that. So you uh, typically don't. Like most, most people would have two separate kilns for the two different processes. Yeah, it okay. would. It would probably eat. I can imagine a chemical process where it start eating away yeah. the heating elements. Yeah. If you're doing it, wrecks production. them pretty quickly. Also, the bricks, and everything else. Yeah. Um, because we live in an environment of twenty percent oxygen, and and basically everything around us is used to that. So it makes sense the metals wouldn't like it. Um, awesome. Okay. okay. So there's a couple other things to mention. Um, shrinkage in clay bodies. If you see right here, the, the blue fired piece and oh, the greenware, that is the same piece made with a mold. Look at the difference in size. Um, that is something that you have to kind of learn to anticipate. And it's very easy to calculate, like every clay body is gonna give you the shrinkage percentage. So you can figure out how much smaller it will be. But if you're trying to get things to fit together or you need it for something specific, you sort of wanna know. Um, the uh, it this it could be a lot, and usually the higher the fire, the more the shrink. Um, another thing that actually the higher the fire, the more, more the shrink. Yeah, typically. Um, but it, it does have to do with the mix in the clay body as well, like what's in it. Um, so kiln shelves are made of different materials than your ceramic piece. Okay, so. The slab itself, if you have two things stuck to each other that are even temporarily that are expanding and contracting at different rates, that can cause cracking. Like you'll get that S crack right across the base, like you saw earlier. Um, and in order to avoid that, you put a cookie, which is just a slab of the same clay that you're using in between your piece and the shell, okay? yeah, which is this? kind of what that is there. Yeah. The other thing is. Um, when you're doing glazing, you can use these little kiln stilts, which are just like little risers or little metal prongs to sort of lift it up so that your piece doesn't get fused to the shelf. Um, 
or you know there's lots of reasons you would want to you know lift it up but usually it's just so it doesn't get stuck or get glazed on the shelf um and then i love this this is um beth cavender stitcher who is this amazing amazing ceramic sculptor and this is one of her pieces this is going into the kiln that entire kind of polka dot whole uh thing that's a support made out of the same clay that she built just to get this thing through the kiln and fire so that it doesn't slump because it's got thin legs and a heavy body, you know, and it stays in place. And you can absolutely do that. If you don't, if you don't join clay properly, it won't stick to itself. So it'll come apart even though it's on fire next to itself. So um, you, you absolutely have like 100% the ability to do anything like that to support the process. That's cool. And then once it's fired, it can stand up on its own. Yeah. Is this white like maybe some sort of a mold releasey film? Um, it's just newspaper. It's probably there to sounds, just create a release. Yeah. Sounds great. Awesome. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, pretty much. Except like instead of like forming like this, it starts here and so like, mm, right. like this. Yeah. Um, so glazing, they're they're basically it's kind of a, a bunch of very fine, different minerals that create different color effects that are applied to the surface of your bisqueware. Um, when they're fired, they, they turn into glass essentially and um, are then impermeable to water. When you are glazing something, if the thing won't absorb water, the glaze won't stick. So mm -hmm. if you try to dunk something that's already glassed essentially, it's just gonna run right off. Um, you can use this to your advantage by using waxes and other resists on the surface of an otherwise porous piece so that you can get patterns. Oh, that's cool. You know, it's like a little, you could, you could literally draw on it with a crayon and you'd be able to, you know, get that. And that wax will probably burn off. Yes, in the kiln. it'll just <laughs> evaporate or yeah. evaporate and incinerate. Um, so that's the reason that you do the bisque fire, then you glaze it, and then you go back into the, uh, the rest of the fire. And you have to sort of stop at that point if you want to glaze, otherwise it won't work. Sure. Um, low fire glazes, which are used in earthenware, have a huge range of options for colors and, um, and different effects. And they're really, really reliable. You know what you're going to get. Um, this one up here in the corner, all those different colors, like that's a, a low fire earthenware piece. Um, traditionally, many of them get that beautiful color with lead. Red, so lead is lead is often yeah. turns chemicals red. Yep. In color. So and bright red color and old pottery might be lead. If you're working in someone else's studio, most most commercial studios forbid lead based, uh, you know, for sure. obvious reasons. So you want to know before you bring something in. Um, and then like the mid and high fire glazes because of the, the temperatures involved and the, the different you know, chemical effects that are going on, they're going to be more muted, but you also get kind of these interesting like blending, like they'll melt together and flow a little bit and you get very kind of artistic effects with it. Um, so like the mug up top. Yep, that's a stoneware. And it, is it two different color glazes? Yep. Yeah, that's two different colors. And that's a style of glaze. Yeah, it's just, right? it's, it's probably just a particular color. There's oh, a so million of them out there. You can, okay. It's just like paint, kind of, you know. Um, and you can... So the bottom brown is the same kind of glaze as the blue? Yeah. Okay. Listen. I mean, probably. Like, you know, there are some where, like, I would say that to get that kind of effect, it's too even for it to have been an accident. Right. Like it looks like they probably dumped it in the blue and then did one side brown, flipped it to the other okay. side brown. Yeah. That's what I guess. I'm um, and but some places will do that. Like there are Chino glazes and other things that will have like a, a super variation. So porcelain isn't a glaze. Like that makes no porcelain is a clay vibe. Porcelain's a clay vibe. Just like brown and well, clay. Well, I mean, Porce yes. is the white, white, white translucent clay. It's very, very hard. Okay. Yeah. So um, that's Pharrell or, that that's what Pharrell was trying yeah. yeah. He's a por that's a porcelain piece with a porcelain, like a very high fire glaze on it. Okay. Uh, that's a celadon glaze. It's that very light green that's very typical in a lot of Asian ceramics. Yeah. Um, uh, porcelain in, in my head, I'm thinking like, it's what Corel wear wants to look like. <laughs> it's lighter. It's almost always very, very light. 
you know, lighter. Is it lighter? Um, lighter? Well, okay. Porcelain is insanely dense. So if you have like a cube, like it's going to be very heavy oh. per like, you know, unit, you know, if you have a cube of one inch cube of yeah. lead versus stoneware versus earthenware, that it's going to be very, very dense. But the thing with porcelain is that you can get incredibly thin walls. So often a porcelain piece will be very, very light because it's exceptionally thin. Uh, and so that's kind of the the the, uh, the property of it that has been utilized the most historically. Is that how you get more detail in a course? It's not so much the detail as the ability to make it light and thin um, and very hard. Like for what it is, it's super durable. Mm. That's why you can make a doll's head out of it. Yeah. Porcelain doll. It's going to deal yeah. with... Uh, Toddler banging yeah. it against like. Like, do you, have you guys ever seen those like Yandro figures that are different? They're crazy, um, like detailed. Those are all slip cast, and they're they have all these thin little parts, and that is done with porcelain. It would not work with a lot of others, or if you tried it with a different clay, it would probably just break instantly. Yeah. So it's a durability thing. Cool. All right. Ceramic techniques, master rapidos. Okay, here we go. Throwing on the wheel. Yay! Uh, this is the one that I'm excited to bumble through <laughs> a little, little bit later. Yep. Um, it is full pursuit of symmetry. And you can see here some of the processes of somebody sort of pulling the walls up on a ceramic piece on a wheel. And here's somebody stretching it out. The You have to have a very steady hand and be like you're one with the, the wheel. Centered, and, yeah. yeah, you got to know what you're doing um and it takes practice be ready to have a whole bunch of things go wrong i feel like this is regularly in sitcoms is like sure. a comedy plot point or to for the full ghost moment or whatever <laughs> whatever it is that you want to do yeah um because this it's where your wedging comes in you want it to... it's often dramatic yeah um but um josie and a few other people come in and regularly use the pottery wheel and it's really cool to watch them do the thing so it's fun. And then this, I don't, that is magical. Yep. It's like they spun something on the wheel and they sliced it and sort of. You can use it as a, you can use it to make pots and bowls. You can use it as a technique. Yeah. It's a round spinny thing that like, allows you to make a cylinder that's even. Yeah. So, and this, it would have made a round thing and then cut into it. Yeah. Right. The goal with throwing it always to make everything even. Yeah. Cool. So you, would you cut into it then, like before? You let it firm, and then so yeah, it, it would yeah. be yeah, kind of in between. Yep, that makes sense. Okay, slab building. Slab building is super fun. You can get really cool things. Uh, you can a slab is just basically rolling out uh, an even thickness of clay, and you can use templates to cut shapes out of it. You can build boxes, cylinders, you can make really big things quickly, and then you can kind of like build your own ceramic I-beam kind of supports inside of other things. Like, say you throw something, but you're afraid it's going to collapse, you can use a slab to reinforce. There's all sorts of stuff. You use the score and slip technique, which is basically using liquid clay right and scoring, which is just putting lots of little scurvy scraw along one part and then the second part and joining them together with the slip, which basically functions with glue. And if you do that, it becomes a solid piece. Slip, to be clear, is just extra wet clay. Extra wet clay. Very, uh, very liquidy. This is, I have fond memories of doing this a lot in high school art. Yeah. It's really fun and you get stuff super fast. Yeah. Like you That's want great. some big old like container for your kitchen or something, you can do that. You don't need to know how to yeah. throw. <laughs> If you're trying to do the pottery wheel and then you get too frustrated and you want to go back a level, this is it. Yeah. Uh, and then wormy okay. dealies. Coil, coils. I'm going to go back two levels. Yeah. This is it. Well, I mean, you can do really cool intricate work with coils. This is sort of like the OG <laughs> like ceramics technique. Um, and it's, it's the same thing as like our 3D printers. It's just laying down layers until you make a shape you like. You can use, you can do it like a little birdie up there inside other forms um, to, to make it as like a, you know, a pattern. Yeah. Or you can use it just functionally to build things. And then you can either roll out your little snakes or use an extruder, which is basically just like a big, like a pasta press of clay. 
And is that how you make the slab web? Like an extra slab? Uh, a slab is simply like, done, like the machine is a slab roller where it would be basically just a giant rolling pin that's fixed in place that squashes the clay out into a slab and right. back and forth. You can literally do it with two sticks of the same height and a rolling pin and just make yourself an even slab that way. It's very low tech. Is so it? you just need a way to roll it out just like you would dough if you're making cookies or something. It's the exact same thing. Probably a little more meticulous than dough. Mm -hmm. Like if you got one of those dough rollers with the rings on the side yeah. so it's always the same thickness that that would be helpful for slab if you want a consistent thickness i didn't know that existed yeah, yeah. my sister got me one and i love it she's great uh yeah, just stepmom got them one oh. i've never used it uh let's make cookies <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> uh slip slip casting slip casting a favorite of mine this is how all that like paint your own pottery stuff is made um and every tchotchke you find at home goods uh, this is it. so the mold here is plaster and um the way that this is done is a mold is made of an original form in this case it was a cute little pumpkin there's it's, this top yep wow. it's made to come apart perfectly so it has no undercuts and you fill it with liquid liquid clay which is the slip that we were just talking about with the slip and score method the plaster sucks water away from the clay that is right up against it the slip that's right up against the plaster and creates a skin. And then when it, you've let it set long enough and the skin is thick enough, you pour out the extra and you have a hollow form. The next slide actually shows the technique a bit more. Oh, yeah. So into the mold, let it sit, it develops a skin, you pour out the excess, and then you've got yourself a hollow mold. This is a production potter making a, you know, making casts there. Yeah. And you can do multiple parts, like you cast the the um, handle separate from the pot, the cup and put them on, like or you can do this all sorts of amazing this. stuff. Sorry, and keep on. this is how most mass produced ceramics are done. It's definitely factory assembly line yeah. sort of clay work. The thing with it is it has to be the mold must be made of plaster for it to work, or it will not remove the the moisture and get you that thin layer against the surface but like so. this i mean this teapot just the mold alone makes me think like meticulous production yeah. factory line um because of how complicated it is with no undercuts yeah someone heavily engineered that was yeah with slip casting you end up kind of engineering the thing to be easy to cast so <laughs> um, that's, that's it and that is that those are those are all, many of the things you might have wanted to know about clay, that it's dirt, mm -hmm. uh, how you put it together, magical, magical dirt. that it that it has lots of different firing temperatures, and then techniques for how to put it together. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, but it's most fun to go get real messy. <laughs> and there's clay downstairs 